this as well, actually. Oh, you got it, Shashi, right? great. Uh, so uh, this is the second distinguished uh, ICON seminar for the Center for Innovation and Control Optimization of Networks. This is a brand new center here at Purdue uh, that's focused on those broad themes, uh, bringing together faculty from across the College of Engineering and across Purdue actually, who are you know, working on these important topics um, to be able to tackle grand challenges in a, in a cohesive way. And, and part of that is bringing uh, very uh, eminent speakers uh, uh, to campus in normal times and, and virtually in these times uh, to be able to uh, you know, give us their perspectives on, on autonomous systems and so forth um, and to help us uh, you know, make even more progress. Um, so uh, the center was um, you know, uh, the output of much discussion among many of the faculty and, and uh, was graciously supported by department heads and the administration. Um, and so that's something we're very grateful for. Um, so today we have a couple of, um, of department heads here to, to welcome Kevin as well. And so I'm gonna hand it off to uh, uh, Professor Eckhard Grohl, who is chair of the department of, uh, of the School of Mechanical Engineering. Eckhard. Yes, thank you very much, Reyes. Uh, appreciate. Uh, I will keep my remarks grew, uh, uh, short considering the advanced time, but I, I wanted to congratulate you for uh, bringing the center uh, to live, you and uh, Xiao Shui. Uh, it's, a, it's a great initiative. I'm very, very pleased to see uh, the ME participation. Uh, there are 12 fa ME faculty members participating in the center. Uh, we have uh, various research activities, uh, so uh, lots of interaction. Uh, but for the audience, I also would uh, like to mention that related uh, to center activities, ME is working on a new professional master's program in robotics that is, uh, uh, I think, uh, pretty closely aligned uh, to what you're doing here. And uh, some of the uh, ME faculty that are very active in the center are actually uh, actively working on the curricula for uh, this master's in robotics that includes uh, people like uh, Dave Capillary in particular, uh, but also uh, uh, Greg Shaver and Neera Jane, right? Uh, all people uh, and George Shu that are certainly a part of the member. I would also like to mention if there are people out there uh, from industry uh, uh, calling in today, uh, listening to the presentation, uh, we, are, we are in the process of significantly advancing our online offering. Uh, we switched from the Purdue uh, online master's offering to uh, the edX platform, just like uh, ECE did. And uh, via edX, uh, we're hoping to reach a, a much wider audience of students. Uh, you can pursue micro masters, uh, like small chunks, and then uh, collect them uh, to get actually into a full online uh, master's uh, degree uh, from Purdue. Um, so uh, uh, there too, uh, we're, we're looking at maybe a concentration of specializations and this area that is represented by the ICON Center is definitely very well represented via our online courses. Um, so there are additional opportunities. And of course, uh, there's lots of research going on in the school uh, in this field. Uh, and we're inviting everyone uh, to come and, and participate. Uh, so uh, I uh, definitely uh, uh, also would like to say welcome uh, to uh, Kevin Wise as a distinguished uh, speaker today. Uh, I know there will be a formal introduction, so I won't do that, but uh, uh, it's a pleasure to get to know you via, via the web. And uh, with that, I will hand it back uh, uh, to Xiao Shui, I think. Is he coming up next? So I'll go on from there. Thank you very much. You're on mute. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Eckert, and uh, thank you for your support. We actually, you know, thank uh, all the support from all our school heads, and well, uh, our, from the dean's office and also our control faculties uh, to this center. So, uh, at the center launching events, we will organize a series of distinguished icon seminars, uh, which will be mainly from uh, NE members. So especially today, our speaker is uh, very distinguished and he's uh, academically, he's a member of National Academy Engineer. He has done a lot of pioneer research on uh, applying adaptive control and robust control into uh, aircrafts. And, uh, and also, he is also a uh, vice president at uh, Boeing. And so, you know, we have, we have invited uh, uh, Eckert uh, to, uh, to welcome our uh, 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 
the speaker. And we also actually have invited uh, uh, John Sutherland and the faculty and the head, but also as an old friend to formally introduce our speaker, Kevin Weiss. So John, it's all yours. Thank you, Xiao, Xiao Shui. Um, as Xiao Shui mentioned, and good morning, everyone. My name is John Sutherland, and I'm the uh, Fazenfeld family head of environmental and ecological engineering. Um, and I would like to say that I met Kevin when we were both toddlers because I have known him for more than 40 years, but unfortunately that's not the case. I have indeed known him for 40 years, but we met when we were in college. So that means we're, we're far older than, uh, I would like to admit, uh, as Xiao Shui mentioned, Kevin is the vice president and distinguished senior technical fellow for the Boeing company. In fact, he is the only Boeing employee in that job category. And like myself, he received his bachelor's, master's, and PhDs, uh, PhD degrees back in the, the 1980s. Um, he's worked on the military side of the Boeing organization, uh, worked on vehicle management systems, flight control systems, um, control system design and processes for both unmanned and manned uh, uh, spacecraft or aircraft and weapon systems. He's authored numerous technical articles and, and book chapters and actually has a textbook on robust and adaptive control theory with aerospace examples. Um, Kevin is a fellow of IEEE and AIAA. And as uh, Xiao Shui mentioned, he's a member of the National Academy. Um, couple personal reminiscences. Kevin and I had numerous controls classes together in graduate school. I think we finally decided that it was about three classes or four uh, optimal control, stochastic optimal control. We had a whole class on extended calm and filters. We learned all about the dynamics and control of super tankers, which is kind of interesting given our respective jobs at this point. Um, and I'll note, what's the nicest way to say this? We would run into one another at social gatherings. And in fact, whenever I drive by his uh, house here in Champaign, I, I think fondly about a barbecue we had there. So with that brief introduction, let me introduce Dr. Kevin Wise. So, thanks, John. <clears throat> See, and thanks, Joshua. It's a great honor, obviously, to, to be a speaker here at this event. Let me just double check. Everybody can hear me OK? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. So let's see. I, I have a little video that has some cool things in it. Go ahead and play that just as a. Great. So as you can see, we, we, I work at a great company, you know, building products like this is just unbelievable. And, and we wouldn't be able to do that without the important engineering colleges uh, around the country and around the world that all uh, create engineers that allow us to engineer these, these really fantastic products that help society. So in my talk today, I'm going to talk about some of the autonomous systems. I've kind of specialized in unmanned aircraft here at Boeing. I've been kind of the chief architect. And then, as many of you know, I, I've been uh, trying to make adaptive control uh, an engineering tool that we can use in our products. And so I'm going to talk about uh, where we've been headed in that regard. I'll, I'll try to speed up here a little bit. So aviation, back to my pointer. Aviation 
system started off with the Wright brothers. They were the control system. Now, it, you know, as we desired to go faster in these aircraft, right, we learned that the control systems had to adapt. The workload on the pilots were extreme physically. They had to mechanically hold the loads during maneuvers. So we developed hydraulic systems to alleviate that workload. And then as we progressed into the 1990s and stealth uh, became an important attribute, these aircraft are open loop unstable. And so control theory really is the enabling technology that allows us to fly open loop nominum phase unstable aircraft. So this is, gonna, is a really important discipline for the aerospace uh, industry, as you would imagine. And adaptive controls play a, a, a really important role. And we're, so having uh, this capability, it's very expensive to go to the wind tunnel and, and model these systems. And so there's, and there's errors in these data gathering uh, techniques that we use. We have to be robust to it. So that's, I'll talk more about that here. Now, X-45, um, we had two X-45As, we have a X-45C, we call it Phantom Ray. This was uh, a program that started with DARPA that transitioned into the Air Force. This was really a foundational program for autonomous systems. We have a single operator controlling up to four aircraft. And so what it did was it transformed the pilot from a pilot worrying about stability and control of the vehicle to a battle manager, where now they're focused on the mission. So, you know, coordinated flight, uh, deploying weapons, things of that nature, all autonomous. And so we've been building on these kinds of systems. And here I have some pictures of our Phantom Eye demonstrator, these high altitude, long endurance aircraft that we we would like to be able to park up there. We were designing a, a, a airplane called Vulture. Uh, its goal was to fly on station for five years and serve as a telecommunications uh, relay. This is an airplane called Odysseus that we built at Aurora Flight Systems that's getting ready to go, uh, go to first flight. So flex, highly flexible aircraft. I'll talk more about that too when we get into the control part of it. Recently, we've We've had some major program wins here in St. Louis, the, the T-7 trainer for the Air Force, the MQ-25 uh, drone that will serve as a autonomous tanker for the Navy. We've got X-37 and, re and reusable base vehicles that go up and perform missions and come back and land fully autonomously. And then we have a new airplane that's just now entering flight test called the 777X. It, just a, a, a great new in, uh, entry into our portfolio, uh, a large aircraft that will really improve the, uh, the flying experience for passengers that fly it. So autonomous systems, you know, this, I tell my students, you know, we're, we're in a robotics revolution. I mean, it's just amazing. So now we're seeing Autonomy and in automobiles, we have a lot of different kinds of vehicles that are out there flying around doing autonomous missions. You know, key to sensing our environment and understanding what we see through these sensors. So the fusion and perception is very important. And there's a lot of talk about using machine learning and artificial intelligence in these loops. So I'll talk a little bit about that also. And so this is, there's a lot of competition now for I'll just say control engineers and people working in this field. You know, we have, you know, Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, all hiring GNC people, so, as well as the aerospace companies all needing GNC people to, to, to work these kinds of applications. So I'd like to, being a controls person, obviously I like to use uh, block diagrams to talk about the control of these uh, intelligent autonomous systems. And, we have the kind of the most inner loop control where we're actually steering the vehicle. So we're, we do autonomous takeoff, flight, maneuvering, come back and land with, with 
with no human intervention. Then we have algorithms that tell the aircraft what we want it to do. So we kind of talk about mission management in that regard. But those could be waypoints. They could be, you know, uh, if, you're if you were developing air combat maneuvers, you would be performing various maneuvers. Then we also need to interact with other aircraft. And so we want the autonomous systems. There's a number of programs like Loyal Wingman, things that are just uh, merging to, to be part of uh, the system and operate in a seamless manner. And obviously they have to deal and interact with the humans that are controlling. And then we have various layers uh, outside controlling these flight packages where we're looking at battle management and how can we optimize uh, how our systems operate so that we don't lose any of them. Yeah, so very important work. And, you know, the question is, you know, so, so where does machine learning, where does AI fit into this whole, uh, this whole hierarchy? Now, what's really important about autonomous systems is being able to deal with what we call contingencies. Things on airplanes, go, they go wrong. You know, there's failures, there's things that uh, all of a sudden you're, you, you may get hit with a bird or you could lose an engine. There's just, and when you're a single engine aircraft, losing an engine is quite important. So how do we, how do we make uh, these vehicles robust accommodating all these failures? And how can we affordably engineer the software and test and V&V &V this, kind, this kind of uh, autonomous adaptive adaptivity, you know, for dealing with these kinds of failures. So this is a picture here of, of a couple of computers that we use in the Phantom Eye uh, aircraft, dual redundant. We have software in these computers that have to detect these failures. Now, you can't really detect a failure often. You, what you're detecting are symptoms. So you have these symptoms that are occurring that you know uh, th that you don't want. We have to categorize their severity. When things are going wrong, we have to report that back to the systems that are controlling these vehicles. And we have to embed in our overall system a re response plan. So if the engine is, has failed and you're not able to restart it, the aircraft is gonna come out of the sky. There's just no other way about it. So wh what is the system going to do? A and how do we make this so that it's deterministic and predictable, and we can so we can V and V and uh, mature this software. So this this is the Dark Star aircraft. This is one of Boeing's first uh, autonomous aircraft, and we learned a, a lot about contingency management in this particular airplane. It, it was it was it had an engine that was kind of undersized, so we had to accommodate high wind scenarios where the airplane airplane was actually traveling. Uh, with negative ground speed. So we have all kinds of things like that that can occur. Then we got into the X-45 and here you see the C and then the Phantom, Phantom I airplane. Now, in the commercial area, there's, there's really a, a revolution going on. Lots of companies, lots of startups trying to develop vehicles that we can put in our garage. And so here's some pictures of some examples that, a, that Boeing's working with uh, Aurora and other companies on. This would be just a tremendous capability. There's been a, a lot of business analysis looking at scenarios where, the, and these are fully autonomous vehicles. So you get in they, and they take you to your destination and you get out and you don't have to be a pilot. These are flown autonomously. And so you look at, you look at certain you know, urban uh, areas where people commute. And we've done studies by looking at cell phone uh, usage as to how these people are traveling uh, through these urban environments. So there's a, a significant uh, business opportunity here to put air taxis in place that, to help relieve some of, the, some of the traffic congestion. These are fully electric vehicles, they're green. So there's, there's virtually no environmental impact there. So obviously very exciting and then you know, there's package delivery. This is a, a very large drone that we've uh, developed here at Boeing, uh, capable of delivering large payloads. And 
So when we look at these advancements in aerospace, you know, what, what are the things that are really making a difference? You know, so we have the ability now to uh, sense our environment. You know, we're, we're looking at uh, developing autonomous freighters. We have, a, we have lots of autonomous aircraft on the military side of the, of the company. You know, how do we bring in the technologies that make this safe? Uh, how do you sense your environment? If you're in a snowstorm and you can't see the runway, how are these vision systems? Uh, obviously, they have to be augmented with other sensors, like millimeter wave or something that uh, can help look through these, these weather events so that you know you're on the runway, that you know you can taxi without uh, causing an incident. But then we're also looking at, I'll, I'll just say that the digital modeling, this is a big deal right now. Uh, Dr. Roper uh, has done several talks about um, the digital twin. We can actually model and simulate all aspects of our aircraft, including the manufacturing of them, before we even build, before we even cut any metal at all or, or form any plastics, yes. And so now we can really look at the interoperability, the affordability, how much the total ownership cost of these systems are, are going to be in, in the long term, and engineer this uh, so that it's, it's affordable for our customers. So this is another part of the revolution that's going on. I'm sure everybody in academia is, is very familiar with this. Very exciting work. So now let me talk about adaptive control, some of the progress that we've made there. We have very complicated systems that we fly. To think that uh, these airplanes are linear in any way is just uh, not a good assumption. We make approximations, we form a set of ordinary differential equations that model this, uh, these type of behaviors. We take linear models, design control systems, stitch them together through gain scheduling, but there's lots of uncertainties. And as, we, as you look around the aircraft, you can see there's just lots of different nonlinear effects. We go to the wind tunnel with a very small scale model. We blow air by these models. We, we use strain gauges in the sting to measure forces and moments. But when you get in real life and you've got the real vortices coming off, there's a lot of interaction, just lots of nonlinear effects. And, and we wanna be robust to this. In the commercial side of our business, like when we, when we built the 787, they go into flight test and they learn and measure the aerodynamics of the full scale aircraft. Then they have to stand down, fold those learnings into the models redesign and retune gains, go back out and through a period of these tuning cycles, mature the system as well as the model of the aircraft because this model is very important. It feeds our training systems. And so that they have to be certified just like the airplane has to be. So they have to match. And how do we take the development cost out of this kind of uh, activity? So there's a, there's a lot of interest in using adaptive techniques. How can we have real time learning uh, as we're in flight test with different kinds of systems. And as you would imagine, adaptive control, adaptive techniques can play a little, uh, can play a, an active role in this kind of thing. Now, here's some pictures of some damaged airplanes that the F-15 here is not showing up very well. This is the, the flexible Helios aircraft. So flexible airplanes, fighters, commercial aircraft. Back in the early 2000s, I, I had a program called Restore with Wright-Patterson where we flew adaptive control on the X-36 out at Edwards. And we were able to inject failures into that airplane and the pilots would perform air combat maneuvers. This is an open loop, unstable aircraft, non-minimum phase. Yes, and we made, and with adaptive control with failures and we were able to perform seamlessly. The pilots could not tell the, the, that the failures were injected. The airplane kept flying with level one flying qualities. So our customers are very interested in maturing technologies that provide what I'll call robust control. Now, these are real machines. And I'm gonna talk a lot about the frequency domain. When we put sensors on an airplane and those sensors, gyros and accelerometers, they measure the flexible dynamics. Here's some pictures of some of the modes of the phantom eye. You see they're quite low frequency. So we, we used, in the old days, we, we had frequency separation. 
between, I'll say, the short period dynamics that we're trying to control. We make the actuators fast enough to control those dynamics, perform maneuvers, and then we hope the flex modes are high enough frequency where we have separation and no interaction between these other dynamic systems. Sensors typically high bandwidth, so they, they tend not to play too much of a role in this. But when we get into these large wing vehicles, I mentioned the Vulture program, that was a 400 foot span aircraft, 400 feet that weighed 7,000 pounds. Extremely, it was basically a wet noodle. And how do we make these things fly? And for those of you that uh, are not familiar with um, you know, aircraft controls, we have something that's called, we call it aero servo elastic, where the, the, the flexure of the wings, it can change your aerodynamics. Uh, obviously, if we excite these modes, and if, and if you think of the loop gain in your control system, if it amplifies that frequency, the, the systems can self-destruct in air. So this is an absolutely flight, flight critical uh, problem. And I use this picture here to show, so the actuator, you know, moves linearly here through this bell crank and mechanism, we convert that into a, a rotational motion. And as these surfaces rotate, the torques associated with this motion, the angular acceleration of this surface are all reacted back into structure. And, and so this excites these modes. And if, in our control system, if we don't attenuate these frequencies, then the system will go unstable. So this is a very critical part of doing aircraft control. So obviously it's important if I talk about adaptive techniques, uh, how do we make sure that we have a safe system? Now, in addition to working at Boeing, uh, I do a little consulting on the side where we've been, I've been helping oil and gas companies, particularly uh, Helda and uh, Stad Oil in Norway. I'm working with some companies in uh, the US as well. Helmerick and Payne's uh, flex rig that you see here leveraging aerospace technologies to improve oil and gas production. If we looked at trying to create an integrated control system that could help uh, in these drilling operations. They have the same problem that we have in aerospace. It's a very nonlinear problem, very hard to create models. They're infinite dimensional. How do you create control systems that can run on the rig that make this safe and perform? And so we've been using, uh, working with the companies. We actually have software that are running on uh, rigs currently that are using these modern techniques that I'm going to talk about here shortly. Now, historically, this is, this is a, a, we started flying some adaptive techniques. I mentioned um, X-36. So the NASA, Air Force, the Navy, you know, have been very proactive in helping us mature uh, adaptive methods. This laser JDAM, I'll talk a little bit about this, but this is, there's been a number of different techniques and we, we like to use, uh, at Boeing, we like to use just a control architecture that has a baseline control that's in charge and then put an adaptive increment on top of it. That way we can V and V the baseline control and then any errors in the models, the adaptive can, can then take, can take care of. We, we've used a number of different types of architectures and different kinds of algorithms. And there's, oh, there's been issues with these that I'll talk more about. In our weapon systems today at Boeing, we're using adaptive controls. And laser JDAM was an important one. That, this was the one that really opened the eyes for the customer. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. X-36, uh, here's the JDAM uh, Phantom Ray flow, flew with adaptive control. This is what the block diagram looks like for JDAM. We, we have a, an optimal control-based uh, baseline control that we have an adaptive increment that feeds in. We have the, the vehicle, we have the inertial measurement unit, the rates and excels that come out. We, we, we filter those to clean up the signals. We, we do some tricks right here to shift the zero dynamics uh, of the, to make the, we call it a virtual IMU to make the system not look like it's non-minimum phase. That when we, so when we feed it back, this is a technique that's in the textbook. We call it a virtual IMU. There's a center percussion of the vehicle where things look like a pure rotation. We shift in software uh, the, the sensor so that it looks like it's ahead of the center percussion. But we have to do that by differentiating the pitch rate. And if you've got 
noisy signals, that, that can be problematic. But, then, but I want to talk about this adaptive uh, system. This is actually first flight test data that we used. So we were commanding some maneuvers. So here we're commanding some high angle of attack maneuvers. We actually command some side slip maneuvers. We bank the uh, vehicle. And you see here that uh, what I should talk about is, so what's the big deal? Why do we need adaptive on this vehicle? You see all the orange stuff that's on this weapon. So this is laser JDAM. So JDAM is, a, is just a munition and we put a laser seeker in the front. And so the computer's in the back. So we had to run wires. You see a raceway on the bottom of the vehicle. We have this doghouse here where we have to go into the tail cone. We've got T-bolts and straps that are holding all these pieces on. So none of this orange material was in the model for this weapon system. So we took the JDAM control system, made it adaptive to compensate for these the, these, the new aerodynamics that are gonna to occur to this. Now this weapon comes in at near supersonic speeds. So there are shock waves coming off of all of these things interacting with the tails. So there's a, there's a, a huge change in the aerodynamics. And as you see, it performed flawlessly in first flight. These are the actual control surfaces. So now you see that the black due to the adaptive control, learning the new aerodynamics real time, Greatly different than the red curve, which is our model, which is our sixth off simulation of this system. So the adaptive techniques uh, played a really key role there. So in 2006, I, I wrote a paper with uh, Eugene Lebretsky and Naira Hobekamian from Illinois on open problems in adaptive control. So we've been trying to mature these, these methods. This is a picture from the X45 of the, of the current in an in a EMA actuator when we get into a structural mode. So when you have an oscillation uh, on the aircraft, the current draw goes up exponentially with frequency in these EMAs and you basically, you, you burn out the power control system uh, on the actuator itself and you lose your actuators. So we can't have wiggles, we can't have frequencies. And this has always been a problem with adaptive controls because you need this persistence of excitation. You need these oscillations in order to learn and adapt. And we're trying to develop methods that uh, minimize uh, this effect. Now, Naira, as you know, uh, if you track adaptive control, she's developed a technique called L1 adaptive control. But we were inv involved in all aspects of this. Now we've kind of converged into this, uh, we call it observer-based adaptive control technique. I'm going to talk about that here in, in, in some detail, show you a little bit of simulation results. But it actually has significant improvements in what I call linear robust control. We, we've really, using these observers, we, we have found out how to design them. So that really creates a great control system. So what do we need to do for adaptive systems? We, we, have, we, need to, we have to improve the transient performance. That's these oscillations. We don't want those. We need fast adaption. So in one of the uh, programs that I did with Restore, we simulated in flight the wing being shot off by a missile. And the pilot uh, being, could not control the aircraft, obviously, with just the baseline control. We put adaptive into that uh, system. And in flight sim, we we're able to show that the pilot could maintain control with, with such a huge uh, failure uh, in, in the system. Time delay margins, very important. Anybody that works adaptive systems knows that most nonlinear controls are sensitive to time delay. This is just a problem with uh, nonlinear techniques. And we need to be able to design these systems affordably. So we need to automate the design, take the cost out. So we call this method observer-based loop transfer recovery. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. We have a transition timeline that we've uh, developed. We have a number of vehicles that are flying now uh, using this method. We've, we actually incorporated this uh, server-based control into the 777X as part of the auto flight system. And I'll talk more about why we did that. So you see some blue stars here that talk about flight test. Uh, now, we, we have this method in our textbook, but we're working on a new, a new version. Some of the algorithms that I'm gonna talk about here we've developed since we published this book. So Eugene and I are working on a second, second edition of this, of this textbook. Now this is, this is a really important uh, 
slide right here. So when we have flexible body effects caused by our actuation systems and those exciting the modes, we have to, historically, we use notch filters and low pass filters to basically attenuate anything that's high frequency. That adds lots of phase lag at the low frequencies. Adaptive systems don't like that phase lag. Ba any kind of control system doesn't like that phase lag. So, th so that's, been a, that's been a problem. This is how, and so what's really nice about uh, using observer-based architectures is that we, we can design the optimal control, which is this black Bode plot that you see here. This is just the, the gain. But when we use an observer, we get an additional 20 dB per decade attenuation provided by the observer with no phase penalty. So we use loop transfer recovery to recover up until the loop gain crossover. And then we allow the system to roll off and take advantage of this additional attenuation provided by this, this algorithm. This is a, a, a scalar example of an adaptive system. This is, explains what we're doing with these observers in adaptive control. We have a, an uncertain nonlinear, this is linear, uncertain system here where we don't know the A and B matrix, but we have a reference model that we want the system to perform. Now we've added to this reference model an observer gain times the error. We have, a, this is a total adaptive system here, no baseline, so the control laws, the hat represent the adaptive laws, they're nonlinear. And you see the wiggles that I'm talking about. This is a plot of the error. And these oscillations are what we don't want. And we see that as we tune the observer, we can tune out the oscillations that occur in the, adapt, in the adaptation. So this is really important. Now, this is the model set up for our, the general systems that we have. We, we model the, we linearize at a flight condition have a control signal and we have this uncertain nonlinear function. This is the control power gains. We don't know what they are. So we're using this structure to, to, uh, to develop our adaptive control laws. As you see that the, the uncertain nonlinear function is matched with the control. We're going to design the control law to have a baseline control, BL, and an adaptive increment. We do a little bit of algebra and transformed into the design model where we have a baseline control. Now we have the adaptive system and this is the, the non, uncertain nonlinear function. We don't know what they are, but we want the adaptive system to, to compensate this. And then thus the baseline control provides all the performance for the, non, for the nominal system. Same design model. So now we're using this linear quadratic Gaussian structure. So we have optimal control for state as if we had state feedback and now we design an observer that provides the estimated state. We Use this observer as the reference model. We call it the closed loop reference model. So we take the air from the aircraft in the model, put it through a dead zone. We have a neural network that provides the, the adaptation. We use a projection operator to keep all of the adaptive gains in a compact set, we use this for V and V. So the error drives the adaptive laws. If the vehicle behaves like the model, the adaption doesn't do anything. The baseline control, which is embedded into the reference model is in charge. When the aircraft doesn't behave like the model, the gains adapt and regulate this error so that it, it tracks the reference model. We need a process you know, if you're gonna use this in industry, we have to have a workflow and a design process that engineers can follow. So we go through, we pull in our requirements, we do optimal control design, we build our observers, we're building up a high fidelity simulation, we do uncertainty modeling, we produce code and get ready for flight. Frequency domain is very important to us. We've got all of these subsystems on the aircraft that we don't include in the design model. We have to be robust. So stability margins, very important. Now, this is where the cool part comes in. You know, when we're learning control theory, we talk about transmission zeros. And I never really uh, use those until we get to this new algorithm that I'm gonna talk about. 
we have to design the optimal control and then we have to design the observer. So we're using the control algebraic Riccati equation, the filter algebraic Riccati equation. And we like automated tools, automated processes. So what we've done with the design of the observer, so we need to design this L gain. This is really important because this is the sensed signal Y, which has measurement noise on it. And so we're gonna use loop transfer recovery. This is the form of the uh, observer design matrices, the Q and R matrix that goes into the, what you would call the covariance equation, but we're not treating this as a stochastic problem. We're really focusing in on the frequency domain aspects of this observer. So we take a baseline Q matrix and we add to it B times B transpose, where we artificially square up the plant, adding minimum phase transmission zeros in a desired location. Thus, when we use loop transfer recovery, poles go to zeros. So I'm gonna talk a lot, a lot about that, right? Poles go to zeros. So we've introduced these artificial transmission zeros into the Hamiltonian structure. And I'll show you that. This is something that's well-documented in textbooks. So this is the structure, very simple for say an unmanned aircraft. We take a model of the system. We use servo mechanism theory. We're gonna add integral control. So we track our commands and Here's the state feedback uh, that we use to, to stabilize these unstable aircraft. We have to pick this Q matrix in the design of this control law. So when we look at the Q matrix, the first thing that we do is penalize the tracking error. So we form this Q matrix, we go into the solve Riccati equation, and we go and evaluate frequency domain metrics and time domain metrics. So this is this is a model of the Q, we, if we sweep this Q1 squared from small to large, then we're, then we're gonna see that the bandwidth of the system is gonna be varied. Now, what I wanna talk about is typically we command acceleration in our flight control systems. So if we were to put some numbers into the model and compute the transfer functions, you'd see that we have some right half plane zeros. And we wanna control acceleration. Now, this is numb in phase, and we know that poles go to zeros. If we look at the Hamiltonian matrix for optimal control, this is all in Krakenek and Savant's textbook. That's where I learned this back in uh, back at, at Illinois, but I, I didn't really soak in until just a few years ago how we could leverage this. So what I, what I want to show you here is, you know, we know that the Hamiltonian matrix gives us the closed loop eigenstructure for our system. It has stable poles and the mirror image of those poles in the right half plane for the co-state. So if we take the determinant of the Hamiltonian matrix and actually compute the polynomials that are in this determinant, we see these acceleration zeros show up because of the penalty that we put in the Q matrix in trying to command acceleration. Now, the nice thing is we, in the Hamiltonian, it mirrors those zeros over into the left half plane and we get a root locus that poles are approaching the mirror image of these unstable zeros. And as well as the stable zeros are mirrored to the right half side. Now, as we try to get more performance in our systems, so here, as we try to increase the performance rise timing, so here's the bandwidth getting faster and faster, the unmodeled dynamics that are in the system eventually cause the system to go unstable. So we'd like to figure out how do we pick these optimal control penalties? go back up there. This undershoot, systems that are non-minimum phase have undershoot. So if we plot rise time versus undershoot, we, could, we see the knee and the curve where we balance performance with how close we're getting to these unstable zeros, we get a really nice design. We come up, we, we get reasonable gains. Now we have a nice state feedback solution that's very robust. Now we talk about the observer, the same technique that we were just talking about with the Hamiltonian for optimal control. We can look at the same thing for the observer design. And when we square up the system through this B matrix by adding columns into with B, creating these transmission zeros, we can show that the zeros that we place, the poles of the observer are influenced by these the, the zero dynamics. So th this is one of the uh, 
analysis uh, pieces that's in the textbook. If we look at this loop transfer recovery and what's happening with as little v goes to zero, this is the part of the loop transfer recovery, we know that the gains get large. When gains get large, poles move to zeros. So all this stuff that I'm talking about. If we do a little bit of algebra, we see that as v goes to zero, we are forcing the solution of the Riccati matrix to become strictly positive real. So this is, this is an asymptotic property. We obviously can't um, let little v go to zero because the gains go to infinity and, and we can't implement large gains in real life. But this is just a great property uh, that under, underpins this observer-based control. So to make this observer system designable, we know we need the eigenvalues of the observer to be faster than the eigenvalues of the optimal control. We want the observer transients to die out quickly. So we, we know that the gains of the observer have to be faster. Now, Travis Gibson, uh, a, a PhD student at uh, MIT graduated, one of Anna Swamy's uh, students, a Boeing uh, funded student. So we, we fund uh, Anna Swamy at MIT. She's graduated a number of PhDs uh, helping us mature the adaptive control theory. Came up with a, a tuning rule uh, for this L gain in the observer and it's associated with its two norm. We know that the gains get large as, the, as this recovery parameter is asymptotically made to go to zero. So we, it's very important that we look at the sensor noise transmission into our control and control rate. This strictly positive real property that I just talked about, when you look at this Riccati matrix times B, this, this, just think of a single input system. This, is a, this will just be a column vector. And this is, this is a column vector on this side. So we can actually compute the angle between these vectors. We see that when we're starting the design, these vectors are often nearly orthogonal. And as we recover through loop transfer recovery, they become parallel. We're gonna use this P matrix in the Lyapunov function for adaptive control. And that's what ties the theory all together. So the model-based reference model adaptive, adaptive control tied into the observer. We have to be able to implement these things on a computer. So as this L gain gets large, we, we need to make sure that the controller itself is stable. We don't wanna implement an unstable controller. And we need to make sure that the eigenvalues of the observer are below our Nyquist frequency. So we use, this is the adaptive control law. So we have a regressor vector that's a neural network that's designed to put uh, these neurons where we think we have uncertainties in terms of modeling. And we, we have weights that we call theta that we'd like to learn and adapt to. And no, this is the adaptive gains. So we have a baseline control, we have an adaptive increment. This is the adaptive law. And we take the, like I mentioned, take the training air to drive this. The learning rate, this gamma is, is critical. So it has to be tuned. And this is where Gibson's tuning rule comes in that you can set based on the two norms of these matrices. This gives you a tuning rule for the learning rates associated with this neural network based adaptive control. Dead zone, very important. We don't want any sensor noise to pass into the adaptive gains. So, so we use a dead zone to filter out. So these are all things that we have to worry about in, in practical tools that engineers can use is we have to have a design recipe that tells them how to take this advanced theory and actually make it useful and implementable in our computers. We use the projection operator limits to make sure that the gains don't go, this is like integrator management. Every integrator in a flight control system uh, has gains that are, has limits that are set to make sure that the integrators don't, don't walk off. We have to do the same thing with these adaptive systems. So here's some, some simple simulation results. I'm trying to go fast here, I'm almost done. So here I'm taking the X-45 airplane. Here's the, the, the model that I talked about. We have a baseline control that's based on the observer. Now I have an adaptive control. And for the uncertainty, so I don't tell the neural network what the uncertainty is, but in the simulation, the uncertainty that I modeled was the baseline control. So this is an unstable airplane and I'm putting in 
an uncertainty that cancels the baseline. So there's no control. The adaptive has to do everything. And so you see here, it learns very quickly uh, what, the, what the baseline control needs to be. And we use the, the, tuning, the, the Gibson tuning rule for setting the learning rate. These oscillations that you see here are undesirable. So if this is not, uh, this is a test that shows us how fast we can adapt. When the baseline control is actually turned on, we don't see this behavior in the, in the system, particularly in the ones that we fly. Now, to further test this approach, I'm gonna add a huge pitching moment into the aerodynamic model. This is, this is a tremendous, this is, and I'll just say that I have some hypersonic programs that I'm dealing with. When we have uh, engine unstart, where the engine flames out and uh, it creates a huge pitching disturbance. This, this is a, a typical model of, of that effect. So the system doesn't know anything about it. Now, in addition, I'm gonna cancel the baseline control. So in this simulation, we've got no control. I've got this huge pitching disturbance that's un that destabilizes the system. Now, what you see here, every time I, I, manu I maneuver through this two, this two degree angle of attack region, you may not be able to read that number, but that's like right in here. We, the system learns and we're actually able to take the neural network weights and reproduce the uncertainty. And you can see how well it, the blue is the actual, the green is the estimate, how well the neural network learned. And that's because we, we're, we are persistently exciting the system through these maneuvers. So let me summarize. So I talked a little bit about autonomous systems. We, we, we all see these every day coming. Uh, this is a, I, I think it's just a very exciting time to be a control engineer, to be an engineer in aerospace, to be an engineer period. You know, this, it's just amazing all the products that we're going to see here in the next five to 10 years that are going to help mankind. You know, I, I've showed you this uh, observer-based adaptive control. We call that a closed loop, closed loop reference model. We really have adaptive methods today that I feel are safe and implementable in our aircraft systems. We're, we're using them today in a, on the military side. When, when we look at technology transitions, it, it typically takes about 20 years on the military side before we get it into the commercial side. So we're trying to accelerate that learning, but obviously we have to be safe. And so we, we need to make sure we understand this theory. That's why we can, we've continued to, to do development at, at MIT, at Illinois, at various, working with various professors in this, in this area. So let me just say thank you. Uh, it's been a pleasure to, uh, to speak here today. Uh, I apologize for, for being late. But thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Kevin. And uh, it's it's a great seminar. And uh, you know, I think I apologize from my side. I forgot to remind you the Purdue is actually in the Eastern Zone. So uh, thank you very much. And it, it's actually a great seminar with uh, a lot of nice examples uh, to show how control concept play a key role in design this system. I see the optimal control adaptive control, especially, and also the observers there. And uh, so it, it's great. And especially it, 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 it fits our center uh, scene very well. And uh, ICON's uh, uh, mission is to integrate classical control series optimization networks with advanced uh, learning and AI and the big data to design analyze autonomous system. So we will, we will take uh, questions uh, from now. So for audience, please, uh, uh, you either could type your question in the chat box or unmute yourself to ask a question. How do I view the chat box? Oh, you could, uh, I think underneath there are uh, several buttons and the mute stop video oh, let's see. and the share screen. I think the next, left the button left to the share screen that's the chat but it, it's fine i could read the question to you but i, I could ask the question first 
So uh, from your uh, Kevin, from your talk, you uh, we have see a lot of concept in control, and uh, you know for control theories we have adaptive there, we have optimal there, and we have also robotic part there. So what is your insight on uh, when you decide for them which method you want to go, be more like a, uh, your choice between the classical theories and the machine learning method? Yeah, so when you look at these aerospace systems, that, that's why particularly autonomous systems, mm -hmm. just think of these, you know, the uh, small drones, you know, the quadcopters or whatever. If you lose one of your propellers, mm -hmm. dynamics, you know, change rapidly, right? So we need to make sure that we have control algorithms that can accommodate these serious failures in these systems if we're gonna rely on them. Now, automotive applications, what's really nice about cars is that they sit on the ground, <laughs> right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. controlling speed, that's really the, your, and steering them obviously away from obstacles is very important. The mechanical systems in automobiles are very reliable. But when we, when we get into aerospace and we have jet engines and we have propellers, a bird strike can very easily break a propeller off and completely change the dynamics. So now where does, so your question, so robust control and adaptive control, like I said, really needs to play in the inner loop. We, we, now, where do we need machine learning? You know, the ability to see our environment, you know, the, and make decisions based on this perception is very important. This, this is where we see these methods coming in. I can today, and this is how we did some of these other systems, I can string out waypoints. You know, I can come in with GPS down a waypoint plan for the airplane to follow. And it'll do that job like a robot. But if, if we want to have an artificial pilot, we're going to need to have AI, systems that can see the environment, that know that they can steer on the taxiway. If they need to maneuver around an airplane, they can see these things. So, th so th these AI-based systems, if they're gonna ever be used in commercial aerospace, they have to be certifiable. Th th this is a huge challenge. So I think there's just great work being done in this field. Uh, it's so exciting, but the end result before we can use it, you know, in transportation systems, we're going to have to figure out how to certify this kind of software. Yeah, so that's that's the big challenge I think uh, ahead there. So you mean that actually the big challenge is uh, the trust or certified AI system, right? Yes, the the certification. Yes, if we have to have a human oversee <laughs> those systems, that defeats the whole purpose. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we. Uh, so for everyone. So uh, please, you know, type your question in chat box or unmute yourself to ask a question. So we do get a question from uh, Suya. Okay. Sorry. Can I... Yeah. 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 Bing. Yeah. Yeah. Bing. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Kevin. Um, great to say that uh, the complex uh, control theory uh, is uh, trying to. Uh, you guys are working on this here, applying the, the complex control theory to the actual uh, industrial application. Uh, so I'm Bing Yao, professor at uh, uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, I'm teaching adaptive control here at Purdue as well. And so I will be, yeah, great to see you, you guys are working on this. And uh, I think later on, probably I'll send you the, uh, the syllabus, the course notes, and we can have a, a, a frank uh, discussion on the, this topic. Uh, yeah, I'll just mention it. Uh, great. So you, you are using adaptation and trying to, for example, deal with some of the issues like oscillations during the transitions. Um, uh, I just mentioned that uh, the here in the adaptive control course, and because I'm working on this called adaptive robust control, um, and essentially here I have probably had a little bit different perspectives on how to deal with uh, that kind of say the oscillations during the transient, and how what's the way to use the uh, adaptation. So, so, so I mean, it's great to say that uh, you do show students that uh, advanced control theories is useful in 
have to have kisses. I see, I'm not sure I understood the, the question there. So you're teaching adaptive methods. You're using something else to deal with okay. the- Yeah, uh, adaptive bus control. Um, so uh, here, right, uh, you're using uh, the observer-based ones. Um, I think that, that that's how we, we just take a look at the, the problem with the traditional adaptive control. I think that poor transient is mainly because the controller, underlying controller design is based on LTI, linear time environment, our traditional LTI uh, control design. So, uh, and uh, really the adaptation is just like an, an integral. And uh, if you are only focusing on adaptation, it's more or less that we are only focusing on see how to tune the integral gain, but then it, it, intuitively you see that if, like, for example, it's a second order system, if you don't have a good underlying and um, the uh, control structure, like say, your D gain is too low, with a larger P gain or uh, integral gain, you will get the lightly damped close to post and you will get oscillations. So another way to deal with those oscillations is going to strengthen your body. Just say, uh, I'm going to, uh, is essentially you, uh, the choice of the integral gain or adaptation gain rate has to really take uh, is integral part of the say, overall control gain, just like underlying how you tune, to tune those, uh, the, what's the con right control structures and what the control. So that's, uh, I, think, um, uh, I think, my yeah, so, of, you know. so I think the method, you know, the, to improve, so what, you, what I heard you say, I think, is the, so the adaptive control algorithm clearly is just nonlinear integral control. And uh, in a way, uh, yes, uh, we, just have, we just have to, because the linear integral control is only dealing with, let's say, the constant input disturbance. That's the structure, right, in ways. Just say, in, in reality, the uncertainties may come not from the input side, it's through certain structures. We are just trying to make full use of the structures, but it's still, anything learned is only learned, things change comparatively slow to what's your underlying dynamics. And so, so in that sense, just say, uh, you, you can, we're, mathematically, we're only learning constant, unknown constant. And so, so, so more or less down to the integral. Yeah, so I didn't really talk about, you know, the sigma mod and mu mod, these other uh, variations that we have in adaptive controls to add damping into the learning. Yeah, yeah that's just add, add the, uh, the, the damping to learning, but uh, not changing the underlying structure. It's not to say that uh, you're, <coughs> the, 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 uh, really just say, if you are fixing the second order systems and, and I is learning, and, but underlying half system we are fast is that, uh, see the uh, PD, PD, right? PD is trying to uh, make sure that say your two online close to post can be way to the half, Half to half left, half left plane. Then you can have large eye gain. Otherwise, you cannot have a large eye gain. If a large eye gain, you will get oscillation. So the, you know, using this closed loop observer, we obviously design the regressor vector of the adaptive system to identify where the uncertainties in our LTI models are. So this is a very important aspect of this structure, is that it feeds our ability to update all of our models toward certification of these algorithms. Now, there's still concern that an adaptive control law can do something you don't like. How do we prove that it's gonna be safe, right? We, we do this, I'll say LTI controllers in commercial aircraft through gain scheduling. We use stability margins for this, but you know, so this is still a, a hurdle for us using these methods. But if you think about what I, what I said earlier in my presentation about the, these, these learning cycles that we go through, where we go to flight test and we learn, we update models, we update gains. In the uh, commercial aircraft world, we have what's called black label software. That's the certified code that's on the jet. We can put in a partition, what we call red label software, which could be adaptive, which could then feed certain model structures and adapt and tune the gains real time, avoiding the cost associated with these tuning cycles. So, so this is where we're trying to leverage this technology. 
there's lots of different adaptive algorithms that are out there. There's, just like there's lots of control methods, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Every professor has their favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So, yeah. yes. So, but we're trying to, what's really nice about optimal control. So I didn't really, you guys all know optimal control. You, you have excellent stability margins when you use optimal control. It, it's, and it's an easy method for engineers to use in practice. When we use the observer, we need to have a good design recipe to create that observer. So that's what I kind of, that's, that's where you, you've seen this MISRA algorithm where we artificially square up the system. So he, pu he published that paper in the CDC with no, uh, no idea that anybody would ever use that algorithm, <laughs> right? So we've, we've thanked him. It's, it's turned out to be a huge uh, benefit for designing observers. So this kind of reopens the door for this LQG type architecture. <clears throat> you know, it's, let's see, we, we have a tool that we use uh, here at Boeing. It's called AutoGain. It's an optimal control design tool. And it, it basically, just automates the gain design across the entire envelope. Mm -hmm. and so it's it's these kinds of tools and processes that we need in industry. Uh, yes, great. Uh, so that, 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 that's part, uh, part back to that. So later we can have good discussion on this. Uh, essentially, uh, for me, let's see, for the controller structure, it, uh, if here we're dealing with linear time and uh, the, the uh, high frequency dynamics, then we have this kind of systematic robust kind of traditional uh, uh, even let's say for uh, traditional robust control like an HFMAT, all these kind of things. So that will give us good underlying base, uh, baseline control. Essentially, you want to make sure that it uh, handle certain the, the rational dynamics uh, in general, but then adaptation, and uh, we use control, let's say here, observer, this observer base is also just why it compared to traditional improvement, because we are using observer now you are separate from actual dynamic. Previously, the, uh, our adaptive control, everything is just tuning your, your on baby baseline control game. That's really, really bad. So now you, you separate these two things so we, you, you can handle these things a little bit better. Um, but, so th but, th but now, uh, see, that back into what I'm doing here, Jesse, yeah, you realize we have this kind of, should have this kind of structures, then how to, uh, but, but both structures are feedback. So we still have to, when you put them together, how you deal with this kind of thing, you don't have a, a really just a, a learning and dealing with slower one, and but slow or fast, if everything is, is comparative. So the, the, the interface there is very important. For example, here you're also using projection. And why we are using projection, it's just a, that's kind of a, give you a safe interface that whenever my adaptation is doing really wrong, I'm cutting it off. Uh, so, and yeah, so, so, so I think we have a lot of things in common and then we are getting, uh, Let's work together to make the theory complete and uh, also really make sure it works in reality. Thank you, thank you, Dean. Yeah, thank you, Dean. I think, yeah, definitely, I believe you and uh, uh, Dr. Wise were having a lot to, to talk. So we could have moved to next questions. I noticed that Martin and uh, Tom uh, unmuted themselves just now. So uh, Martin and Tom, do you guys have questions? Mark, I just had one quick, go, go ahead, okay. Mark. Yeah. This is Martin Carlos. I just had a quick question, uh, Kevin. So Hi, it, looked, it looked like in your models, all the nonlinearities were matched with the control input. Is that right? Yes. So is that a common in aircraft? Yes. That, so that's a very convenient structure for us to use. The primary, so when you look at the models that we're using in airplane control, the uncertainties are matched. Now, what, what it, so there's been you know a number of people like Naira and others, Anaswamy, that have looked at unmatched uncertainties. We, we have algorithms for that too, but th this is a very convenient structure for for what we're doing here. You know, something that's very important for us. You know, we we have when we talk to the certification agents, even on the military side versus commercial side. There are rules we have to follow. I, I have to be able to show stability margins. I have to compute them and show the certifying agency that I have stability margins, which means that rules out 
some nonlinear control methods because you can't actually compute stability margins with them. So in aircraft, this is, we have to do this. Now, that kind of uh, requirement, I'll say limits some of the model structures that you can use. I'll just say, and that's to, to your point of matched versus non-matched. Yes. Oh, I, I see, because those stability margins are all based on linear systems. Yes, exactly. It, it's a requirement. So there's, as you, I'm sure you, you, you all know, like there's the AS94900 requirements, there's MIL standard 1797, you know, all of these requirements talk about the need for, we have to follow this process, you know, in, with our customers in the FAA, yes. That's kind of difficult, you know, you're, you've got a nonlinear system, you'd like to use some more advanced nonlinear control techniques, but you can't use them because the specs that the military have are based on linear systems. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, mm. yes. Okay. That's interesting. So now I'll just say that in the research, and very nice question, Mark. So in R&D side, like working with NASA, they, they have uh, like on, they've had several test aircraft like the uh, maneuver technology demonstrator. I think they later called it active F-15 where they have computers that reside next to the flight computers of the aircraft where they can put advanced algorithms in and then test these, these techniques to see if they really do work on a real platform. You know, so there's been lots of, mm -hmm. you know, when you get into the practical transition side, you know, how do you prevent stall? You know, when you get into these, you know, can we, is there a, is there a control system that can prevent, you know, that can help with stall prevention? So there's been work at NASA, Irene Gregory, uh, she's a senior scientist there, you know, pushing the, the barriers forward in using advanced techniques that you can't linearize. You right, know, right. Yeah, we don't know how to certify these, these algorithms, but we know that there are nonlinear techniques out there that, that really help in very different problems. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Yeah. Uh, Kevin, uh, my name is Tom Shi. I really enjoyed your talk. I'm not an expert in controls, and I thank you for giving a talk that's uh, so clear uh, that even a non-expert can understand it, so I really appreciate it. Uh, I used to be a head of Air and Astro, so I have two questions uh, for you. One question is, um, you mentioned the gap. One of the gaps are is that the ability of the adaptive control to basically address uh, contingencies of all kinds. And, and you have to be able to see the environment and also respond quickly and transfer is one. I'd like to understand what the other uh, gaps might be. And the other question I have is, since these problems are highly multidisciplinary I and mean, controls, you know, people in double E and ME, they all, and any of mathematicians understand control theory. But of course you have to understand the problem. Right, the aerospace engineer understands the problem. So, so from an educational perspective, how should we educate our students? I think that's sort of my question. And also for experts who are maybe not in aero, what are the knowledge base they must have? And so I guess mostly it's how should we educate So these are my two questions, gaps and how should we educate our students? Thank you. Yes, so I'll start off and talk about contingency management systems. In the Phantom Eye aircraft that I showed some pictures of, we have about 3,000 software monitors that were designed to, to monitor the aircraft, looking for things that go wrong. So the, so the challenge for us on the industry, industry side is how can we affordably design such a system? As you know, development costs uh, spiral out of control when software just grows and grows and grows and if it, in its complexity. So, so this is a challenge for the industry. As we become more autonomous, as these vehicles become more autonomous, we're going to rely on these contingency management systems. This is a huge piece of software that has to be verified. Yes. So I, I keep pulling that back because th that's the reality that we're faced with in industry is Make, making these systems real. So, the, so cost is the issue. Reducing it, 
not only certifying the software, but also reducing the cost of, of you know, how many sensors, how many software. Well, so then, th then you think about, as a control engineer, I, I have limited knowledge of the fuel system. How do we, how do we bring in the multidisciplinary knowledge that's required to engineer such a system? Every, every part of the vehicle has to be monitored. And so the fuel experts that are, you know, controlling flows and pumps and valves and all of these things, right? So they're, how, how do I bring in the electrical people? And so all of their subsystems impact what we do with the vehicle. So it's a very complicated problem. It's a, as you can imagine, it, it, it can just get, uh, it can just grow to, to where it's no longer tractable. So we, we need to have an engineering approach. This is, and this is some of the things that we try. I can't go into too much detail about how we do that because as you would imagine, it, it's somewhat proprietary, but this is something that we've matured over, I'll say the last 20 years in developing autonomous systems is how we engineer these products. So when you talk about the education of students, this, this is something I'm very passionate about. I, I've been, a, I've been a, a professor, a teacher since I got my PhD back in 1987. So I, I really enjoy teaching. I, there's nothing more important for, than professors. Yeah, we, we, are, we really do a great service uh, to mankind. I, I really stress the frequency domain. This is something that for a control engineer, you know, the understanding these complex machines is so difficult. How, how do, you know, we need to, we need to keep reinforcing to our students, the learnings that all came from the great scientists and professors that were before us. You know, teaching advanced algorithms is great, but this fundamental knowledge needs to be transferred in to the undergraduates. So I see a lot of students come into my graduate, so I teach graduate classes. I see a lot of students come in that are very weak in frequency domain. And when I look at the professors that are teaching at some of these schools, that's because they're weak in the frequency domain. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is just, this is, this is about engineering. This is not about, so yes, you know, th there's some just brilliant minds everywhere, but it's just this fundamental knowledge. We, we have to make sure we can transfer that in and then let students build on that. So I, I think- for my ignorance, when you say frequency domain, I just think of Fourier transform to understand the frequency <laughs> ranges. So can you educate a little more on, on the physical aspects of the frequency domain you're thinking of that we should you know, put in our curriculum or something? Oh, well, I, I'm sure that the professors there that do control yes. understand exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> the gain and phase associated with these dynamics okay. is critical. And these are, these are machines complicated machines. And that, that's really the, you know, we design control systems using a second order differential equation. Believe me, those machines are not second order systems. <laughs> yes. And robustness of all of it gets proven in the frequency domain. Yes. That's Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Oh, really yeah, enjoyed sure. your talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Tom, Tom, this is Martin. The frequency domain Martin. stuff. Yeah. Is, yes. this, is this is the stuff we do in 364? I should take your class. And, what? Yeah, no. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm teaching the class now. You're, oh, but no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to see, <laughs> see your class, Charles, right? Uh, but, I, have a choice. I wish all, I can learn much more about aerospace. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. We, we actually oh. just finished our uh, introduction to the frequency domain analysis. Okay. Uh, body plot and also um, all this, uh, Nyquist plot, all this. So, actually, yeah. Actually, I took it when I, I remember I got my degree in me. I actually took those things. I just don't remember a thing about it. Like, only take your class. <laughs> you know, I, I think many of you uh, knew who Chris Burns was, you know, just a very intelligent man. He, he brought yeah. me to the system science and math department at Wash U that, to help teach the practical aspects of engineering. So, a lot of the things that you hear me talk about, I, my, my focus is on the practical aspects. How do we really, how do people do design versus theory? Yes. So 
yeah, proving theorems is one thing. Now, math is great, but when, we, when it comes down to creating these machines, we really have to be practical. And so bridging that, that's kind of me being the liaison. Yeah. And so I, I've, I just enjoyed so much teaching at WashU because the students are so good. And now that I'm, I've been teaching part-time at Illinois as well, the students are good. The students at Purdue are good. You know, it's, it's great that, with, that so I, I don't know how the, so at U of I, they came to talk to me about bringing in some more practical aspects. You know, so the classes that I teach are really about controlled design, not about the theory, not about proving the theorems, but how do you actually take these algorithms and, and put them in a machine and make them work? Yes. Oh, sorry, this is George. Do you have time for another so question? Do you Yes, we, we are. Yeah, George. Uh, so I'm thinking about, you know, for uh, maybe a last question from a student. We will last student. Okay, and right. then after, after this question, George, we will we will ask Absolutely. all the students to leave the, this Zoom meeting. No, they don't have to leave. <laughs> why, why do we have to get out? I think it's more like uh, we will have more like 20 minutes for faculties. Go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, OK. So we have one question from Suyash. So the question is, how do we guarantee that there is persistency of excitation for adaptive control? So I didn't really talk about it. Uh, I think there were some words on a chart that said we do maneuvers during flight test to get that persistence of excitation. It's required. Now, the good thing about adaptive control is it provides stability without persistence of excitation. It provides stability but we don't learn without persistence of excitation. So anybody that studies system identification, we know that you have to excite the dynamics in order to learn them. Yes, this is the key. Now, when we go into flight test, and when I talked about the JDAM uh, plots, we pulled those maneuvers. We actually did some side slip maneuvers. We did some bank maneuvers. So we excite all the axes of the vehicle to generate that persistence, persistence of excitation. Yes, it's very important. Thank you, thank you, Kevin. Oh yes, certainly. Yeah, so uh, all students, so our seminar time uh, has uh, ended now. So for the next 25 minutes, we more like will uh, save this time for icon faculties to meet uh, Kevin. So uh, uh, students, you are feel free to leave the Zoom meeting. Thank you so much for attending. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm going to leave too. Thank you so much, uh, Xiao Shui, and also uh, Shui as for, for inviting uh, Kevin to talk to us. It's a wonderful talk. And since I'm not part of the organization, I'm going to talk out too. But thank you, Kevin. You're welcome. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I just noticed that our head, uh, Bill, Bill Crosby, also locked in.